Hello everyone, welcome back to the Notcast. I think it's number 395 and I think it is Tuesday, 9th of July, 2024, which means in between this and the last one that I did, I had a birthday uh, and I've been pretty busy. Uh, so I, I went to four gigs. I saw Nick Mason uh, from Pink Floyd uh, with, with his songs full of secrets, perform a set of early Pink Floyd material. I saw uh, the, the immortal ACDC at Wembley Stadium. Um, I saw uh, the National at the Crystal Palace Park, uh, poorly organised shit show in the Fuck Factory, actually. Uh, and I saw a YouTube tribute band on Saturday. And I also, at some point, got that cold COVID flu thing which has been going around, and I've only just kicked it. So I'm feeling back to normal. I am in a bad mood, uh, which hopefully you won't notice, uh, for things that are completely unrelated to, to this. Uh, and also, of course, it was a good week for my birthday because I saw four bands and overthrew the government. Uh, we now have a Labour government, which I'm um, trying not to be political about, but it makes a nice change to have competent, boring people that are capable of doing the job as opposed to a bunch of clowns running a circus. And um, since the Notcast is not generally political, that's as far as I will go. Uh, and talking of things that aren't political, the band I'm going to be talking about today, and I'm kind of dreading this because um, I am not short of opinions, is pretty apolitical as well. It is. Uh, leads answer to Led Zeppelin, The Mission. Uh, and I'll be talking about them uh, because I can't really carry on doing my Sisters of Mercy episodes without talking about what happened to the other people that were in the Sisters of Mercy and some other people that weren't. Um, first and foremost... Uh, what I will say right from the off is if you're a Mission fan and you're watching this, uh, you have to be aware that what I'm saying comes from a place of, of love and respect. And that means I'm going to be a little bit harsh about a couple of things around the band. Firstly, their lyrics are awful. Really, really bad. Terrible, no good, very bad gibberish. As indeed is stated in this very book. Heady Days uh, by Wayne Hussey, uh, where I think on page eight, and let me just quickly go, uh, yes. So, page eight, uh, he says, but I'm going to have to write words for the songs. I ain't ever really done that before. Ah, just string any old bollocks together. It's only stupid journos and other singers that take any notice of the words anyway. Well, I'm not a journo and I'm not another singer. I'm a guy who really likes lyrics, because I think lyric writing is really important. It's about communicating ideas. I've always thought art is about communicating ideas, emotions, and observations upon reality. And that means write words that make some sense, which I'm afraid to say the mission aren't particularly good at. I think I'd enjoy the mission more if they were German, actually. And then I could pretend the words meant something where they didn't. Kind of like a goth craft work uh, from the equivalent of Leeds in Germany. And I can sit there and go, I don't really know what they're saying, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, but since I do know what they're saying, it does kind of matter. And uh, I, there you are. So that's about a minute of me moaning about the band's lyrics. Hopefully the rest of it will be a lot easier. Um, as previously said, this is an absolutely essential tome in understanding, pardon me, the early years of the band, uh, written by the, the rather lovable and generally quite affable uh, Wayne, who uh, by all accounts... He's generally a pretty good chap, uh, and he's, he's not exactly kind to himself in parts of this book. Uh, he, like a great many people, uh, succumbed to the sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and sometimes forgot the rock and roll part of it, uh, which he's fairly open about in here. Uh, but that's not to criticise him too much. He seems to have grown into who he is, and, uh, and like, like anyone says, you know, we've all been young and stupid and done things that are young and stupid. I've certainly been young and stupid and done a few things that are young and stupid when I was young and stupid. Uh, and I'm not, not so young uh, and I'm not so daft these days. Uh, although everyone does think he looks daft um, as, uh, as the song goes. Um, this book tells the story of the first five years of the mission from the moment where uh, Wayne and Craig left the group in uh, about August 1985 through to the fateful morning in, I think, around about May 1990 when uh, a member of the band left and didn't really come back for about 20 years. Um, so that is you know, a really important part of uh, absolutely essential in understanding the band's journey. And what a strange, weird, fucked up journey it is. Um, the first show 
by the band. Um, they wanted to call themselves the Sisterhood. They hadn't really had a name for what they were going to do. Um, and the, the, by using the name the Sisterhood and therefore making it known to the remaining member of the Sisters of Mercy, Andrew Aldrich and Dr. Avalanche, the faithful drum machine, um, that that was the name that they were planning on using, caused Andrew Aldrich to create a, a spoiler tactic really. Um, in patent law, for example, it's whoever comes to the market first with the brand name. Uh, so very similar to the Stormy Daniels Donald Trump thing, uh, which is catch and kill, by, re by uh, releasing something under the name The Sisterhood, um, which Andrew Aldrich created very, very quickly. He effectively killed the use of the name The Sisterhood, because if the band wanted to continue under the name The Sisterhood, they then had to take Andrew Eldritch to court to say, no, you've stolen our trademark. And they're going, well, actually, I haven't. You've stolen mine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and that means we've got an extra album by, by Andrew Eldritch, uh, which is uh, called Gift. I think it's really, really good, by the way, Gift. And it is um, going to be mentioned in the Sisters of Mercy episode that I am going to do shortly, where I talk about Gift and Floodland. Taking that to one side, the mission uh, said on stage, I think the Electric Ballroom in Camden, uh, that their, their first show, uh, 20th of January 1986, that they were going to be called The Mission. And The Mission uh, released their first single uh, in uh, 9th of May 1986. Here it is, Serpent's Kiss. Uh, although the first recorded output of the band uh, is on, this, on the Salad Days compilation album uh, which this this is long out of print now and um, there's a bbc radio sessions record uh, it's also available in an expanded form as the mission live at the bbc a three cd set although in 1993 or thereabouts in the days when uh, the strange fruit records uh, were releasing radio one sessions we got uh, the mission salad days uh, and this is uh, now long deleted out of print vinyl LP by the group that features radio session recordings at the BBC, including the first radio sessions on the 19th of January, 1986 for Janice Long, which I think include Like a Hurricane, Severina, Sacrilege, and, and the dance goes on, according to what's written on here. Let me just quickly check. Yep, that's right, Janice Long's session the day before the first show. And the bands lined up coalesced pretty quickly. Uh, they wanted to replace a drum machine with a drummer. Um, so we put together the holy trinity of the band there. Uh, that is uh, Mick Brown on drums. Fantastic drummer. Uh, saw him play in the mission several times. Very, very good. Um, although apparently not long after the mission split, he went on to become a trucking van driver and was driving you know, Oasis's tour kit around uh, the world. Uh, and then we had obviously Wayne Hussey there on vocals and guitar, Craig Adams on bass, uh, the man who is the um, the single strand that runs through a huge number of <coughs> goth bands. Uh, and I know um, that people like to think that they aren't goth bands. In fact, is there any, any movement that's been more disowned than goth? I don't know. You know, some people, but, uh, you know, every band that, that thinks that they're goth, uh, The Mission, The Sisters, uh, The Cure, um, they kind of go, ooh, no, we're not. It's just, you know, that's what it is, really. So Mick Brown, formerly of Red Lorry, Yellow Lorry, uh, was uh, was brought in to, to play drums. And then the last piece of the puzzle, this chap here, Simon Hinkler. I mentioned him in the Pulp episode a couple of weeks ago. Um, who's uh, in a popular Leeds beat combo called Artery. And then Pulp, who, uh, who was the last to join. Uh, and uh, apparently, and this is according to what's in the book, Simon was more of a stoner while the rest of the band were meth heads. And uh, Simon felt that he didn't really fit into the group left and uh, then changed his mind and came back after a few days. Uh, so it's fair to say the early years of the band were a little tumultuous. But then again, when you're young and full of ambition and, and drive and you, you don't always have you know, the kind of knowledge and understanding of uh, psychology, people and so on that perhaps we do have now, we had a different toolkit to deal with in those days. We had a different set of, of uh, equipment with which to discern the reality in which we're living. And so therefore we didn't know things around, for example, or we weren't open and talking about mental health or uh, around you know, drug use, psychosis, egos, it, all that type of stuff. We're a lot more familiar with those now, I think. Uh, there's a lot more discussion around it. Um, whereas there was a lot of, certainly uh, for me, when I was about that age, let's say mid twenties, there was a lot of me going, is this, 
is this just me? Am I, am I being, you know, unreasonable here? Or is this, you know, I didn't have the, the language uh, to articulately feel the things that I was feeling. And then you imagine if you're like, let's say, and you're at mid, late 20s, rampaging around America in a coke fueled binge of rock and roll, dry, spending 18 hours on a, on a bus, two hours on a stage and, and four hours in a party. Um, it's easy to lose track of who you are, where you are, even what time zone you're in or what language you're speaking. Um, certainly I've done enough international flights to know that. Um, but with that lineup in place, um, the band felt pretty clear that they were set. Although Hinkler, by the way, was also fired for three days, but then rejoined uh, as not in the uh, the uh, all for one and one for all kind of approach. Um, effectively, for the first four years of the band, that was the band's lineup: those four guys uh, against the world, uh, and you know, a classic rock. Lineup. Three of them are still still in the mission to this day. Mick has retired from drumming and hasn't played drums on stage for 28 years, I think. Um, we have a, a pretty solid version of the band, which is going uh, to this day. So we have that, that radio session in January, 19th of January, 1986, which is on Salad Days. Uh, Eldritch released the Giving Ground single by The Sisterhood and then the Gift EP, uh, which effectively killed the band's name. Uh, and so they rebranded themselves a the mission and released their first single. Uh, and here it is, the 12-inch the EP number one on Chapter 22 Records. Uh, Chapter 22 signed Pop Will Eat itself around about the same time and uh, distributed uh, by Nine Mile and the Cartel from a location in Solihull. Uh, this is a, a fabulous opening salvo from a group you would have no idea aside from the fact that it had number one on there, that this wasn't a confident band at the peak of its powers. And it's fair to say that the mission, uh, right from the off, uh, came out of the traps at 100 miles an hour and kept going until they hit the wall. Uh, it was a, as if you have, you know, like um, Eminem's one shot. If you have one shot and you go for it, then that's what they were doing. Uh, is again, this is our, our opportunity, our chance, and we're going to take it. Um, this release was apparently perilously close to being illegal, uh, as the band was still signed to WEA. Um, and uh, I think WEA had suggested vocalists such as Gavin Friday, uh, who's now U2's creative director, who I think was from the Virgin Prunes, and uh, the, the vocalist from Alien Sex Fiend to sing in the group, because they didn't think Wayne could do it, which considering how good, strong, wide Wayne's, uh, Wayne's voice is, uh, is, even if he's not much good at lyrics, he's certainly good at singing. And uh, it's quite odd, really. So they were released from their WEA contract uh, and signed a 7LP deal with Phonogram. But that, that came a little further. These were effectively surreptitious releases that operated in a grey area uh, as EPs. Um, and there's three tracks on this. Uh, one is brilliant. One is quite good. One I don't like at all. Um, so the one that you know, I think is brilliant is Serpent's Kiss, actually. Great song. Fantastic uh riffs arrangement everything it just sounds like a classic i always remember serpent's kiss coming on at the barrel organ in birmingham uh and, and suddenly everyone just going woof and you'd have all this you know people in black with hats dancing and all that stuff and if you see the video by the way for serpent's kiss which is ridiculous uh is them running around a you know a park in leeds with with uh, vampire bats on strings basically mocking the whole of the genre well, that's probably the right thing to do. Um, the lyric to Serpent's Kiss is nonsensical, really. It's, it, I think it's about, you know, like um, some kind of sexy type stuff, really. You know, for, uh, foreign tongue in familiar places. Uh, the Serpent's Kiss drawing blood during sex. All that type of stuff. And this is where, again, I, I pick up the thing about the lyrics. And I'm kind of going, what, what are you trying to communicate with that? Apart from the fact that, you know, you like rough sex. And, uh, and and being slightly racy. And I'm like, well, frankly, that's pretty much everyone who was in their 20s in the 80s. And uh, thinking about singing that lyric, perhaps when you're in your 60s, might be a bit, oof, not sure. But then I think about Prince and the fact that Prince had songs like Rip, Pop, Off, Go to Zipper, Sexy Motherfucker, um, and uh, Pussy Control, for example. And I end up, much as I love Prince, listening to his lyrics and going, I'm not really interested in knowing what a now dead man thinks about how amazing his penis is. Uh, so you have to think about that. I always think art is about communicating ideas and emotions and creating a bond with the audience, listening to that 
and, and communicating together. Uh, I saw a thing that was in the, the Red Hand Files by Nick Cave, who I don't always agree with, of course, uh, saying that, that you know one of the one of the moments for him about art is that sense of, of or for me at least, when I'm and I had this sense when I watched the National actually on on Friday, is people that live the experiences of the lyrics they take their own experiences into the lyrics the lyrics have a meaning for them that is not necessarily shared by anybody else's and that relies firstly on an ambiguity in the wordplay uh, and secondly it also relies on having a, a, an, an articulacy in the wordplay and as i've said before the mission's lyrics are not great so for me i don't get upset i don't have feelings when i see the mission i don't have emotions i have Oh, this is quite good. I quite enjoy it. So, you know, it's, it's entertainment as opposed to art, if that makes sense. Uh, and that's not to, to diminish the band's contribution or the strength of the music. It's just I don't think the lyrics are particularly good. Uh, the second song on here, Wake, RSV. I don't like it. It's, I mean, musically, I think it's very one-dimensional. It's very, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of here? It's very circular, very repetitive. Uh, the lyrics are a takedown of, of Eldritch, uh, the uh, singer from the Sisters of Mercy. But then he released this corrosion, which is, uh, you know, the other side of the breakup, really. And if you looked at the lyrics to Wake and the lyrics to this corrosion, you can kind of see the two as, uh, as um, you know, um, both sides in an argument. And it's no coincidence, by the way, that Wake was the name of the sell-through VHS of the final Sisters of Mercy show of 1985, the final show that Wayne and Craig played as members of the band. Uh, and uh, the RSV in quotation marks there is also the name or the quote or the, um, the, the brackets that go around the back of the Giving Ground B-side. So the Giving Ground, the uh, only single by the Sisterhood, had on the B-side RSV as the, uh, the subtitle of the song. So it seems fairly clear that it's pointed towards the Sisters of Mercy, uh, and I wasn't really going madly into that. Uh, and then we have um, Naked and Savage, uh, which, uh, as Wayne says in page 43 of, of Heady Days, I, I, to this day, I still don't know what that song is about. And if you don't know what that song is about, you probably shouldn't be singing it. Uh, because it could be about a whole manner of terrible things, including denying puppies, you know, scritches, strokes and ear cuddles. So if that's, you know, if you don't know what your song's about, I don't know why you're writing it. I genuinely, I don't. Uh, everything I write has has a purpose and a meaning, and it's not just a bunch of words that are thrown together to fill a space. Whereas Mike Patton, for example, from Faith No More, has a phonetic approach to the meaning of the lyrics. His lyrics may not necessarily make sense and sometimes they're obtuse, but they're designed for how they sound and the meanings that are communicated through those sounds as opposed to communicating a great sense of, of um, lyrical articulacy. For the mission, it's, it's a little bit mumbo jumbo. It's a little bit gibberish, uh, which obviously is a uh, mumbo jumbo is a line from Into the Blue as well. Um, the... Serpent's Kiss also got perhaps a, a, a perhaps a slightly less well-known uh, release on the Sound Showcase EP number three uh, with a remix, which was an extended kind of 12-inch version of Serpent's Kiss. Somehow on a 7-inch here uh, with an extended guitar intro, um, which is on here. And uh, I think that version should be much better known, but it isn't on Sound Showcase number three, which was released in 1987 uh, in, uh, in, on, as a cover mounted seven inch with Sounds magazine, a weekly newspaper from the days when there were several weekly music publications. There was NME, Melody Maker, Sounds, Kerrang, uh, probably loads of other ones as well. I, I can't remember exactly when. The last Sounds was about 15th of May 1991 and had the Wonder Stuff on the cover. So a very long time ago. The second uh, release that we had from the band, which was on the 14th of July 1986, uh, was EP2 uh, featuring... Uh, and let me just quickly quickly make sure I get this correct. Uh, like a Hurricane, uh, an intermission called Gleaming Dome, Garden of Delight, Over the Hills and Far Away, not the last time a Led Zeppelin song will be stolen uh, by, uh, by the Mish, and uh, The Crystal Ocean, uh, alongside a swan song, which is Vigilante Man, sung by Craig D. Adams. And should also point out there was a seven inch of this. Um, there was, of course, 
a seven inch serpent's kiss, but I forgot to show it to you. Uh, there's a seven inch and a 12 inch of EP2. This features a, a Garden of Delight, uh, a song that was rejected by the Sisters of Mercy, although a demo of it does exist, I think, uh, which opens with the line Reflections in the Windswept Liquid Mirror. I don't know what that means. Uh, and a cover version of Neil Young's Like a Hurricane. On the, uh, the 12 inch, Like a Hurricane is the lead track. Then Garden of Delight, Over the Hills from Far Away, and The Crystal Ocean, all of which are songs which are still in the band's sets to this day. Uh, again, on chapter 22, again, uh, a release which is uh, kind of sailing a little bit close to the legal, uh, legal radar, but it's a fantastic EP. Like a Hurricane is a banger live, and I think this, the, the Missions version of it is a definitive cover version of this track. Garden of Delights is here presented in a full band configuration, so the four members of the group making a racket in a rehearsal room. Um, Over the Hills and Far Away is a, is a, borrows a title from Led Zeppelin, uh, although again, not quite sure exactly what it means. Uh, and then Crystal Ocean is, again, another song where I'm not quite sure what it means either. Those two EPs uh, on, on chapter 22 uh, later got a release in 1987 uh, as an album, effectively called um, The First Chapter. And here is the first chapter. This is the UK version of the album. This is the American version of the album. In America, there was a band called The Mission. So The Mission had to call themselves The Mission UK, which perhaps is almost as bad as calling yourselves The Leeds Mission or The London Suede. Um, and so that's that's the name that they had. So there are two configurations of the first chapter, by the way. My preferred configuration of the album is the American edition. It has a different track listing. Um, whereas this has uh, has just the stuff that's on the on the 12 inches. Um, it has like a hurricane over the hills, naked and savage, serpent's kiss, a studio recording of a track called Dancing Barefoot, uh, which appears live on uh, one of the one of the Wasteland singles. It also has an extended version of Crystal Ocean, extended version of Garden of Delight and uh, Wake, and then an extended version of Like a Hurricane, which effectively is a reprise that closes the album. But it's not much point, really, uh, putting that on there. I prefer the American configuration of the album uh, for two reasons. Uh, firstly, this has a different track listing that to me feels better and, and, and more cohesive. Um, the second one is that it has extra songs on it. So it has uh, the seven inch mix, of Tomorrow Never Knows, and it has Wishing Well on as well, a cover version of Free, uh, alongside Over the Hills, Naked and Savage, Serpent's Kiss, and Wake. And that feels like a good album there, uh, again, with um, side one. Well, that's just side two, actually. I've never really worked this out. So, uh, yeah, so side two. Um, okay, so here's, a, here's a, a mistake, a good old-fashioned human mistake. It says side two at the top and then side one. They got that bit wrong. That should say side one and that one should say side two. But you can listen to them in both versions, really. Uh, this says, like a hurricane, garden of De delight, wishing well, dancing barefoot, and the crystal ocean extended. So actually, you can listen to either side of this LP in either order, and it works both ways, um, actually. So I prefer this version because it's got more songs on it. The next thing that we had was a radio session, again for Janice Long, 24th of September. 1986 uh, and this features a song called Wasteland you've almost definitely heard of that a cover of, of the Beatles Tomorrow Never Knows uh, Wishing Well and a song called Shelter from the Storm it's the only studio recording which I've heard of Shelter from the Storm uh, but uh, that's not to say other ones don't exist but that's the only one that was circulating for a very long period of time Shelter from the Storm became pretty much the the band's finale like uh, you know most bands have an old song that they play at the end of their sets that's traditionally known as a set closer. Uh, so, you know, if you're the one the stuff, you have 10 trenches deep. If you are the mission, you used to have shelter from the storm. If you're U2, you have 40. If you're the national, you have Vandalile, Vandalile crybaby geeks. Uh, if you're the mission, uh, if you're Metallica, you'll have seek and destroy. You'll have songs um, and for ACDC, you'll have uh, for those about to rock. Songs that are well known and established as the closing song of the band set. Shelter from the Storm became a sometimes extended, um, almost ridiculous length extended kind of jam where it went through multiple different versions of different songs, a bit of Led Zeppelin, a bit of Rolling Stones, a bit of whoever to become whatever it was. But, but this was the, you know, the studio recording of Shelter from the Storm. Live versions were released on later singles 
uh, there. But uh, again, if you want to get that these days, probably best to go for the BBC set. Although this was released in 2008 and it's also equally obscure and difficult to get, I think, as it comes to Shatala days. The third single, the band signed to another label. Uh, they signed to uh, Parliament Phone or Polymogram, depending on your point of view, and released their third single, EP3. Stay With Me. And uh, I think Stay With Me is a great song. Uh, as is the tradition, every band should have a song called Stay. Uh, U2, Power of Dreams, Shakespeare's Sister, Dave Garn, The Mission, Stay, brackets, with me. You could do a Stay EP, actually. Uh, Bernard Butler. Loads of people have songs called Stay. And I'm not quite sure how I feel about that. It's a pretty predictable title, but it is a good song, actually. Stay with me. Um, I, th I think it's got some, some lovely moments in it. It doesn't necessarily make a huge amount of sense. Uh, but uh, that's, not, that's not necessarily its role. Now, if you want to get really deep into the band's discography, a demo version of Stay With Me is on the Hands Across the Ocean CD single. And I'm not sure if it's been released anywhere else. Uh, I might go and check the Mission Anthology in a minute and see if it's in there. Uh, this, the Mission Anthology was released in, I think, 2006. Uh, and it does feature... Yeah, it, it features uh, Stay With Me and, and a number of other songs that are on there. Um, yeah, all, the, all generally the A's and B's of the band running from 1986 through to 1994. By the way, Permission have done a lot of best of compilations albums, almost as many as Motorhead. Um, don't know why, not complaining, just not really going for it. There you are. You have to be selective. Otherwise you end up, and I don't know actually, maybe Motorhead have 17 greatest hits albums, which for a band that only made 17 studio albums, I think that's quite ridiculous. But there you are, maybe 23 studio albums. I'm not sure. Uh, but this e this EP, stay stay with me, is really very strong. It has Blood Brother, uh, which is still played live to this day on the bands uh, in the band set lists uh, as as one of the main B sides. Uh, and here it is on the the seven inch. This is on Mercury Records. A division, a division of phonogram, and then it also has a song called Island in a Stream. Island in a Stream is a version of Shelter from the Storm, uh, but played acoustically with a different melody. So the guitar lines are apparently exactly the same. Um, and I must admit, I hadn't noticed that until I read it somewhere, that that was the situation at all. I really genuinely uh, didn't, didn't have a clue. Um, oh, that reminds me, I'm going to have to mention that CD later. Uh, but I didn't. Then coming on the 10th of November, 1986, uh, barely two years, less than two years after the release of First and Last and Always, comes the mission's debut LP, God's Own Medicine. Uh, here is a, a vinyl edition of it from 1986. Here is uh, the CD edition. And uh, these have slightly different track listings. So this has uh, both uh, Blood Brother and um, Islands in a Stream on it. This doesn't so of course me being all about the value for money i bought the cd because it had two extra songs on because i'm never going to change uh, and uh, so that's that's who i am now kids um this is there's nothing about this that betrays any sense that it's not a perfectly adequate standard debut album by a young hungry band uh, that have lots of songs lots of ambition you can practically smell the cocaine on the on the, on these uh, on, on the vinyl. Let's just actually, I've got a cold, so it doesn't matter. I might, I wouldn't even know what cocaine smells like. I don't understand those cop shows where someone goes, goes, mm, cocaine. It's like that's not how it works, guys. Uh, because you'd be sat there going, I'm going to be tripping balls in 15 minutes. I'm going to be rubbish as a cop. You know, all those cop movies, they lied to you about an awful number of things. They really, really did. Uh, but uh, nonetheless. Uh, God's Own Medicine is, is probably one of the most drug-fueled debut albums of all time. There's a sense that the band are racing against the traps, trying to finish the record before the studio explodes and they all get blown up, racing to the ends of the songs. There's very little in the way of space or air in this record. Um, and that's actually a really good thing. It's designed to be played live. Lots of bands' debut albums are effectively their, their uh, first set list plonked down onto vinyl. 
And this is exactly the kind of situation that we have with God's Own Medicine, minus the songs that have previously been recorded for the two EPs. Um, it's got Wasteland, which is clearly, uh, once you can hear the, the, the similarity between Wasteland and Marianne by the Sisters of Mercy, written by the same guys, um, you can kind of go, yes, exactly, I get it. I totally, totally get it. Uh, but that's not to say that it isn't a fine, fine choice. Um, it's uh, it's really good, solid, strong debut album. Like a lot of albums, debut albums is a little bit wrapped in immaturity. They're not quite. They're growing into who they are. The lyrics are not one hundred percent clear necessarily. There's some primitiveness in the songwriting, which is a collection of riffs and vocals and things, and it doesn't always sit together well. Some of these songs are not songs that I would necessarily kind of pick out and go, "That's that's the best mission song of all time." Uh, the best mission song of all time is not on this record, uh, but Wasteland and uh, Stay with Me and Severina and uh, Love Me to Death are really good songs. Really great really interesting and you kind of go if you've got an album with four songs as good as that on for your debut you've got a promising future ahead of you and a promising future is exactly what the mission here they had the world on a plate they'd signed a seven lp deal uh with phonogram they were selling out everywhere they were going um and uh they, that that was that was it the lyrics are yeah, as I said before, pretty bad, but they're probably written by a first-time lyric writer. I must admit, my lyrics when I was starting off writing songs the first couple of years, I was not good. I got better, but I wasn't good. But again, having those, if someone said to me, you're going to be writing lyrics, or more correctly, you're going to be singing lyrics that you wrote when you were 23, when you're 63, and I kind of go, God, I really wish 23 me wasn't a jerk. But 23-year-old me was a bit of a jerk. Sorry to people who knew me when I was 23. Um, and the dance goes on, on here. Uh, it was, I think, originally a demo from 1982. I think it was uh, the first song that Wayne Hussey ever released, actually, on a compilation LP in Leeds uh, before he even joined the Sisters. Um, and whilst the album itself was recorded at Ridge Farm Studios in a rush, um, it was pretty much done, dusted, and then the band went back onto the road. Uh, the idea of, in those days, going on the road and then, you know, becoming successful on the grounds of selling loads of tickets, and if you don't get airplay, you get, you know, live audiences. And, oh, I saw this band, The Mission, they're really, really good, you should go see them, etc. That would be the way in which bands would sell themselves if they couldn't get in papers. The Mission could really get in papers. Oh, dear. Or if you went on TV, for example. Um, which means that God's Own Medicine is not, you know, by any stretch of the imagination, my favourite Mission album at all. That'll, that'll happen. But what you do have is these, this cohesive unit that's got a shared ambition and a shared musical direction. Mick's a great drummer. Simon is, is a fabulous guitar player uh, for the Mission. He knows exactly when to put in these the gorgeous, peppery, uh, guitar lines that float over the top of the songs, uh, like, like beautiful textures. Um, and Wayne and Craig provide that solid rhythm backing vocals. And the whole thing comes together uh, like a glorious car crash. You're kind of watching four, four race horses that have got slightly different personalities, but they're all, or, you know, four animals, and they're all going in the same direction as fast as they can possibly go, chasing. The, the sound or the one opportunity that perhaps they've been waiting for all their lives to achieve, which is actually it's a glorious moment to experience if you're a fan of a band, is to be in that moment where you can see a band almost reaching, you know, that moment where suddenly they go from being something to being something else. And it, it's glorious to see. And there's a sense of, you know, kind of not regret as such, but feeling that you're losing touch with, with a band that you, you loved because suddenly they don't belong just to you anymore. They belong to lots of people. Uh, but there's also that sense that, you know, the band are not a secret. And I don't want any of the bands I love to be secrets. I want them to be big. I want them to be popular. I want them to sell loads of copies because I, if, if they do amazing things for me, I want, I want bazillions of other people to have those same feelings about the band. And I genuinely think the mission should have been much, much bigger than they were. Um, I, I think that, I still think that to this day. I think the mission could have been as big 
as ACDC, and for some reason the wind changed at a certain point and the world moves away from them. Um, and that's uh, you know hopefully not a controversial statement to make. Um, the bands were went back to touring, they went back to playing live, they went back to appearing on, on any TV show they possibly could. Um, they released the single Wasteland, probably the, the, the first of the really big hits. Oh my God, I don't know what is going wrong with me today. And Wasteland comes in a multitude of formats, of which I have them all. Well, most of them anyway. I have your standard seven inch here, which is backed with Shelter from the Storm, uh, a live recording. This is an edit of the live recording that's on the seven inch. There is a double uh, seven inch here uh, in a box. And actually I haven't opened this for ages. So it's got two singles, three live tracks and five color photographs. So let's open the box and see what we've got. Well, there's the mission for you. Um, and uh, then we've got, ooh, ooh, hang on a second. So we've got the one one photo of the mission there uh, for your, in, in, the, in these days, by the way, when they did these seven inches, things were lost leaders. They would make the money back on the LP sales. Uh, and this would cost, you know, 99p or something. Um, and then it would cost more than 99p to sell. So rather than sending someone around to go and, and buy up the copies of the seven inch and get it into the charts, they would do these and they would take the loss in a slightly different way. And nobody would sit there and go, this is clearly costing more than 99p to make guys. How is it working? It's like, I always thought, well, if you can sell it for 99p, you can make it for less than 99p. Uh, but I was not yet a qualified financy person uh, as I now am. Uh, so there's your first photograph of the band there live on stage somewhere playing something um, and then there's uh, another couple of things there's your information sheet that tells you what's on here uh, so serpent's kiss shelter from the storm and the cover version of the stooges in 1969 which is fabulous of course uh, there's another photo that looks like uh, there's uh, there's mick on the drums battery uh, which is spanish for drums of course uh, simon on guitar uh, there um, i love yeah, and, and then, of course, we've got the Wayne here uh, and uh, the Craig. Um, God, man, all those hair, all, all, all that hair, all those ideas. And again, not quite sure where these live tracks are recorded, but there are two seven inches. Here is a seven inch of, of uh, Wastelands, which again comes in a uh, picture sleeve. And then, for some reason, without even a cover, here is Serpent's Kiss and 1969 live. 1969 is the same cover version or the same song by the Stooges as covered by the Sisters on the Alice EP and on the Peel Sessions, effectively kind of reclaiming at least part of the band or part of the mission's connection to the Sisters. Uh, oddly enough, of course, because I lived in the age when I could only afford vinyl records, tapes and stuff, if none of my friends had a Stooges album, I couldn't hear the Stooges. I couldn't experience them. I didn't know if they were any good, but I heard 1969 and I thought, that's quite good. I might investigate. Not a bad move overall, to be honest, because I love the Stooges. I think they're amazing. And if you don't, we need to have words because they're, they're a fantastic band, but maybe I'll talk about them some other time in some other way. Um, and then on the 12 inch of, of Wasteland, we had, uh, again, some more live tracks. So what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna bring out, the, because there were two 12 inches. So you can imagine there's a seven inch in a box. There's two 12 inches. That's three copies sold because there's different sets of B-sides on each one. So if you wanted to get the live version of Serpent's Kiss, I think you had to get this. Um, whereas this, uh, this 12 inch, the second 12 inch has uh, an anniversary mix of Wasteland, an extended mix of the track. Um, and he's backed with 1969 live, Wake live, and Shelter from the Storm live. This features uh, an, an alternate kind of LP mix of Wasteland alongside Shelter from the Storm live and a cover version live of Dancing Barefoot uh, by Patti Smith. Uh, so again, different B-sides on every format and you had to buy them all to catch them all. Wasteland was the band's biggest hit at that point uh, and it was very popular it's the one that opens a number of shows uh, opens the show that is on the um, the crusade live dvd here which i'll mention in a minute and the live at reading set that's on here the fifth single uh, released from the album is uh, severina um i think the band's number one somewhere in, in somewhere like south america 
Uh, and there are lots of people going to see them because they were, the Severina was a number one over there and they had to hastily add it back into the band's set list. Uh, which is curious, slightly funny, but there you are. And uh, I don't have a seven inch of Severina, but I do have this 12 inch here, uh, which features the Aqua Marina mix, an extended version of it with Julianne Reagan on backing vocals. Uh, the Amfetta mix of uh, Tomorrow Never Knows, which is on the B side. Um, and a cover version of Freeze Wishing Well, which is tooth faithful to the original for my liking, according to Wayne from the book. Uh, there is also a second track after Tomorrow Never Knows, but I don't quite know what it is. Perhaps just an instrumental guitar texture uh, that was taking it out to the full four tracks. Um, now that sounds like it isn't very much, but it is actually five singles and two albums by the mission, uh, dissected very, very quickly. Now there's a number of other releases which came out after this period, uh, retrospective releases, which I'll, I will kind of pick upon bit by bit. The first one and the most obvious one was a sell-through VHS, uh, which was called Crusade, World Crusade, released on Channel 5 Video VHS. Uh, and then later on this DVD, Waves Upon the Sand, uh, which is a documentary and the Crusade live concert, which I think was recorded at Aldsbury Fair in 1987 as a fan club show uh, and features uh, effectively the band's first live sell-through VHS. I would not be surprised if the performances on here are the same recordings that are on the Wasteland single, uh, I really, really wouldn't. Um, and if you wanted a second live set from the period, alongside the radio sessions, which are on live at the BBC, uh, CD1, uh, which takes you up to um, several, several sessions. So this, by the way, has some sessions which aren't on salad days. Uh, so this has Like a Hurricane, Severina and Sacrilege, which are on uh, salad days, and then the dance goes on from the first session with Janice Long. Uh, there's also Wasteland, uh, Shelter from the Storm, Wishing Well, and Tomorrow Never Knows uh, from the second session. Uh, but there's also Blood Brother and and the dance goes on an alternate version from the third radio session. Uh, CD two of this, which is here. Uh, features the band Reading Festival in 1987, August 1987, alongside uh, a, re a recording from Wembley Arena in 1988. But I'll get to that later when I talk about the Children album. Um, and this has uh, nine songs from Reading. So it has Wasteland and the dance goes on, Like a Hurricane, an early version of Kingdom Come, Wake, Bridges Burning, Child's Play, 1969, and Shelter from the Storm from Reading. So you can easily put together... Uh, including the BBC set um, and some of the other compilation releases you can put together almost all of the B-sides uh, from that period. Uh, what I think is missing from the band, and it's missing from a number of bands' discographies, specifically I'm thinking Wonder Stuff and I'm thinking The Mission, and The The is a good, decent four or five song, uh, four or five CD, DVD, multi-disc sets that really are a compendium of that period of the band's career, which means that for example, Reading 87 would be a shoe in on that. The BBC sessions would be a shoe in on that. Uh, and then also this last release, uh, which came out only last year, 2023, uh, available from the band's website, The Mission, The Last Rehearsal. Uh, the Last Rehearsal Before the First Gig, recorded in January 1986. This is the band in a recording studio um, playing all of their live sets in full and in order um, as best as possible uh, as, as the rehearsal before the show. And this features uh, Wasteland and the Dance Goes On, Garden of Delight, Serpent's Kiss, Stay With Me, Severina, Bridges Burning, Sacrilege, Over the Hills and Far Away, Like a Hurricane, Wishing Well, Shelter from the Storm, Dance on Glass, and uh, a rare song, which as far as I know was never actually played live in front of an audience, Blood from Stone. And when I listen to Blood from Stone, I do kind of think, Wow, that's really good. And at the same point, I also think it's just another mission song, isn't it? It's as good as anything else uh, which, which came around in this period. It just didn't make it to the final cut. Uh, so be it. The band toured throughout 1987 before finally grinding to a halt. Um, Craig bailed on the tour in America. Uh, not quite sure why. I'm going to guess it's a combination of drugs and exhaustion. Uh, the band had a couple of replacement bass players for a short period of time before Craig rejoined. The band supported U2 at Leeds Elland Road uh, in 1987 uh, in, a, in a stadium. Uh, imagine that you go from playing to, you know, 
200, 300 people in the Sisters of Mercy five years previously to supporting at a stadium to then in 1989 headlining the Reading Festival. At Rise is meteoric in the band's catalogue of work or errors, depending on your point of view. Um, the Mission are not one of my favourite bands, but I like them and I like them a lot and I love them a lot. Um, and I think that the, one of the reasons why I like them a lot as opposed to absolutely passionately adore them is the lyrics. Um, and I, I'll come back to this when I talk about other albums in other periods, uh, but the lyrics aren't great. If the lyrics are in another language, I don't have to, I switch off my critical faculties. Um, and I'm sure if I read the lyrics to Ramstein, for example, that they, they might be awful. I have no idea. Um, but when I hear them and I understand the mission lyrics and I kind of go, that's not why, because the songs aren't really about anything. You know, they're, they're about very limited sets of circumstances. And I, I can't understand how people can write bad lyrics, because if you can put together a sentence and you know how words work and then you can articulate ideas. Um, but some, some of the lyrics are not great. But that isn't that is that's on me, actually. Um, that's for me to worry about. Uh, not anybody else, really, I guess. So, and that's something which, you know, every other band which I've mentioned so far, generally those lyrics are really strong. Um, actually, Motorhead lyrics are fantastic. Most people don't, don't really see how good Motorhead lyrics are, but they are amazingly good. Um, but they never get the credit that they deserve, really. So that's, that's the mission, the early years. That's uh, the first chapter. God's Own Medicine. Now I'm classifying these two as one album because the first chapter is a compilation of early singles and God's Own Medicine is a debut L LP. Um, but that is the, you know, the, the early years of Das Mission Band. And uh, I think they're uh, very, very good and, and very underrated and they should be much bigger than they actually are. I'm sure they will agree with me on that. Uh, but in the meantime, of course, I'm going to wrap up here. Um, I've got a couple more gigs coming up. I've got Frank Turner uh, and uh, I'm seeing the Stone Roses tribute band and uh, I've got some work and some other stuff to do. So it might be Sunday before I get to do another one of these. Might not be. I don't know. Uh, but in the meantime, take care of yourselves and each other. Stay beautiful, beautiful ones. And I will see you soon somewhere on the road, no doubt. Okay. Adios, amigos. Ciao.